That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about A Wounded Fawn, the third film directed by Travis Stevens, which just premiered at the 2022 Tribeca Film Festival. It is a Shutter original, which will uh, premiere later on that channel sometime this year. That's a beautiful title for a movie. Oh, uh, <laughs> Travis's other movies? We've reviewed both his previous films. Oh. Um, Girl on the Third Floor, I remember for its Blu-ray. Oh, is uh, that with the like MMA guy? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, which we liked. And I really liked his second film, Jacob's Wife, starring Barbara Crampton. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, here we are with a third film that is a big gamble that uh, I don't think pays off. Uh, Co-written by Nathan Fodry. It's supposed to be uh, kind of a trippy sur uh, homage to surreal art and Greek mythology wrapped up in a serial killer narrative that feels a bit derivative. Okay, the basic story. There is this man who looks familiar to me. Uh, Josh Rubin. What do I know him from? From the movie Scare Me. That's right. Which he directed. We reviewed that too. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, what's his character's name? Bruce Ernst, which is, uh, there's a notable uh, homage in that name we'll get to later. Okay, Bruce is a serial killer. So we're introduced to him at an art auction. And he's going back and forth with some other like art person who's bidding for some fancy customer. And this woman gets the piece of art he was bidding for. So he shows up to her house and offers her like a crazy amount of money saying that his client really wants it. And initially she's kind of unnerved. But then she's disarmed because he's offering her all of this money and like part of his commission. So she invites his ass into her house and he kills her. Then we cut to a woman with her two friends who all work in a gallery. And she's talking about how she's going away for the weekend to have sex with this guy she met who's really sweet. And it's the same guy, Bruce. Mm -hmm. And they go to his cabin in the woods for the weekend. And it feels very much like that movie Fresh with Sebastian Stan. Mm -hmm. So we know he's going to try to kill her ass. And he does. So that's at like the halfway point it, of the film. It's set up as act one and act two. Yeah. Yes. Child, act two fell off so hard oh. that I was like... <laughs> My brain was fried. Like, I can't believe this movie's taking me somewhere I don't want to go. But act two is like a fever dream mm -hmm. where Bruce is like, throughout the film, for the, in act one, we see a couple of times he has visions of like these creatures, which we learn are um, like personifications or reimaginations of these little figurines and a piece of art he stole. The Wrath of Uranus. So... This act two is just him in his mind because when he kills, or so we think, well, I'm still not clear if he did, when he kills the woman, Meredith, he, Meredith, who he took to his cabin, he go like he undresses her and he's laying next to her. Who knows what he was planning on doing with her. And then she wakes up and like bludgeons him with that piece of art. Mm -hmm. and, and then act and two. And then the film does the same to us. Yes. Then act two is him like waking up from that and now he's seeing these creatures from the these three women and then he's seeing the women he killed and the, the, there are three women in these uh canisters and their corpses come alive and are personified by these three women in the and they're taunting him like you're a murderer you're this and that until up to the point where he can't take it anymore and he kills himself and while he's killing himself it's like the end credits the Meredith, the lady who I assumed he killed, she appears as if everything the audience saw was not real, which it's not, obviously. But then she looks like she survived the attack, which was him. It looks like he's stabbing her. He stabs his first victim and her in the neck with something that looks like a garden hoe. Mm -hmm. Like some tool that he you... attaches to his hand, like brass knuckles, like yes. inverse brass knuckles. That yes, so she has her neck wrapped in duct tape, and then she's wearing like a a dress made out of tarp. We can get into it, but yeah, the end. It it's a kind of long scene that runs into the end credits of him just killing his himself and writhing around in the ground. Yeah. 
Okay, so I was initially excited for this because, I, as I said, I liked his two previous films, but it opens with a quote from Lenora Carrington. Um, and the quote is, I suddenly became aware that I was both mortal and touchable and that I could be destroyed. So what's notable about Lenora Carrington is uh, this very notable uh, figure in uh, surreal art. Uh, she had a relationship with a much older Max Ernst, uh, who died in a concentration camp when uh, the Germans invaded France, and she ended up in an insane asylum in Spain. Uh, so I actually spent the morning reading um, her book Down Below, which is kind of a... Uh, years later, she wrote about that experience of this insanity as she experienced in this insane, insane asylum. So very interesting figures. I think there's a film coming out about her soon, too. Uh, and, and that and Max Ernst, of course, Bruce's last name is Ernst. So they're they're... They're, they want us to kind of dip into this territory. Also, the thing with the red owl that uh, Bruce keeps seeing every time he kills somebody, this, this life-size red owl shows up. And I don't know if that was a, a reference to Charles A. Codman's 1877 story, The Legend of the Red Owl. And, and again, it starts out very heavy-handed with this, at, at this auction where this piece of uh, an unknown artistry that's Greek and Roman showing these three sisters, these women, Megara, Electa, and Tisephone is how they introduced, introduced us. Basically, the three fates that are standing over this man uh, that someone has called upon for vengeance. And that literally is what the film does. Literally. When Meredith... When Bruce shows up to Meredith, Meredith's house saying that, you know, sorry to bother you. I know it's creepy, but my client really wants that artwork. We'll pay you double what your client paid, plus a $25,000, like, little check to you. I wouldn't have trusted his ass because he had such an ill-fitting suit on. He sure did. He and <laughs> and in, through that scene and the auction scene, there's this very heavy-handed score. I like the score. It just was too heavy for, I think, the tone by uh, an artist named Val, V-A-A-L. Uh, it, it, and I think Ruben also lends himself to feeling kind of comedic as a screen presence. I didn't, you know, up until Act Two, I was kind of into him, except that, you know, he look he doesn't look legit to me because of what he's wearing at the auction. But that actor, he was fine. I mean, yeah, the way he makes faces, it, you know, it, it kind of makes you want to smirk at him. But and also, you know, he followed her home. Well, right, like you followed me home, and you have on this old fucking big and tall suit. But but anyway. Meredith and her two co-workers at the art gallery. I thought those ladies were really pretty and chic. They were, yeah. That's all I'd say about that. Uh, yes, so that, and I like it up to the end of Act One, and there is some legit tension with um, Meredith, played by Sarah Lind, is kind of, you know, because she thought that she recognizes this art piece and she sends a photograph of it to one of her friends who automatically calls her and is like, get out of there. The lady that had that d is missing. Uh there's some really good tension there, and then it completely flies out the window. Well, before we even get to that, the drive to the cabin, which oh, I yeah. could, which I laugh because to me this is a fucking nightmare. Is she's driving? They're they're driving in his car. He's driving, and Meredith says, "I need to use the restroom. Can we pull over?" And you can tell he's a little agitated. Like, well, we're almost there. Can't you just wait? And she's like. Okay, sure. And then we cut to like, it's still like, it's, it was daytime when she asked to use the bathroom. <laughs> and then it's nighttime and they're still not there. I thought that was funny because I would have like lost my shit. Yes. And then she, they still kind of putter around a little bit before she asked where the bathroom is. But immediately when she gets out is then when supernatural elements start happening because you hear the voice of a woman say, leave. What I think did work well is that sort of awkward tension of, like two people who don't really know each other going away to do something, you know, to clearly the expectation is they're going to have sex. And obviously he had every intention to kill her. But for her, I felt like that actress, I thought, did a really good job. And I think the writing of that scenario up until we get to act two, I think it worked. You know, I kept comparing it to Fresh, which... Because like it's fresh in your mind. Well, yeah. Because fresh also isn't entirely you know original either. Sure, but I, I I think it feels so similar, and that movie feels better. Like sure, it because it is up until Act Two, right? Um, go ahead. It's just that all of a sudden it becomes the tone is is just off, especially in the dialogue and performance of you know these muffled women's voices reading these lines, uh, you know, screaming murder and thief. It, it needed to have kind of a different 
feeling for that to work because otherwise presented as it is it feels like community theater and also oh, it literally yeah and the blood is very vividly red well we get two shots of because bruce prepares a meal for meredith the first night they're at this cabin and we see him like cutting pomegranates mm-hmm. and then it's you know the way it's shot it looks like a bloody scene the fucking pomegranate juice looked more like blood than the blood we see on Bruce and Mary. I was reminded that there's a mystery science theater treatment of a really fun film called The Thing That Wouldn't Couldn't Die. Uh, and there's blood on the floor and they scream, Not the saccharoni sauce. Yeah, That's this, what this blood looked like. This is like saccharoni sauce. It looked like Frank's hot sauce. Uh-huh. Well, I think Frank's hot sauce looks more like blood than this shit. But there are some creepy moments in Act 1, like Meredith, because they're in this, a house in the middle of the woods... And there are a lot of windows, so she sees like odd reflections and things walking by. You know, it's not wholly original, but it it, it was effective enough. I do think that Al, um, that, you know, is sort of like making Bruce kill or is talking to him when he does. I thought that looked good, but everything else looks so homemade. You know what else looked good is when the, in the second act, when the fates take the because they, they present him as the owl is like his alter, alternate personality. Like it's not really him doing it. It's he's being made to do these killings. But they take the uh, mask off of the owl. Do you remember what's underneath it? No. It's the squid-like looking creature. That's actually the, po- I believe that's the poster art for the Polish, the Polish poster of the film Alien. I'm pretty sure that's it. And I thought that looked good. You it, did? It feels all kinds of out of place, but at least it has a more of a visceral response. Because it's him. Well, because then we get those three creatures like in a well lit room, and I thought it looked silly. It it does look silly, but I liked that imagery in that one particular instance. I don't think it really fits with anything else, and nothing else is of of that level. So it's kind of like a a sore thumb. But uh, again, maybe I also just like the reference point. But we get a scene of Bruce masturbating at the kitchen sink after he's like killed Meredith. Which I thought was unnecessary. Because what is it supposed to show? That he's getting some sort of sexual gratification she from a- Well, she asked him when she's in the mask uh, of if he was sexually attracted to her. And he said, yes, he was. And sometimes he can perform sexually as himself. But obviously not as the, the killer version. Um, she also cracks his skull when she hits him with the artwork. Uh, and we see it. like. <laughs> and he has to put it... like he. Like a puzzle, he like pops that piece. I thought back that looks silly. Well, it's also unnecessary. Like it's still, you know, things are gonna get in there. Um, I thought her mask, which you had a lot of comments of Meredith's mask specifically, looked like the poster of Stuart Gordon's dolls, which you'll have to pull up. I don't know. The costuming to me felt like they found whatever they found somewhere and used that because I thought that mask and that wig and then. I don't have any more notes except the ending was so confusing to me because I presume Meredith was dead. But then the very end when that creature takes off its mask or one of the creatures takes off its mask, that awful white mask. And then we have a woman covered in like rhinestones. That's supposed to be Meredith. Oh, it is? I couldn't tell because her hair was slicked back and she's covered in rhinestones and she's painted lighter. Then all of a sudden, like the actual Meredith appears having bandaged up her wound And somehow fashioned a dress made out of tarp. Mm -hmm. And then she's watching him kill himself. So are we supposed to think that she survived that attack? She has access to a phone because right before Bruce attacks her, her friend, because you mentioned Meredith texts her friend a picture of the artwork. And the friend is like, girl, that artwork was stolen. So you need to get out of there. And then she's like, okay, I'll call you once we get in the car. Like, why would you even entertain letting this man drive you back home? But, so she has a phone. So if she survived that attack, why didn't she call the police? Well, again, it's not that film that's trying to... It, it's it's trying to... I appreciate what it's trying to do. This, this metaphorical kind of surreal exercise with all of these references. But it, it, it doesn't pull it off. Uh, I don't have anything and it, else. And because it doesn't pull it off, you were left asking those kind of questions. Sure, you're right. When, yeah. when the film wasn't didn't even really care, sure. they could care less about that. Sure. Like. Um, I did not enjoy this. Act two was really hard for me to sit through. Yeah. What would you give it? I would give it one and a half. I would give it one and a half as well. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button and listen to our podcast. Bye. Bye.